welcome back to another episode of RNT Fitness Radio. And today I'm joined by Shane O'Mara, who's a professor of experimental brain research and author of the book In Praise of Walking. With how much emphasis we put on reaching step targets, going for walks, and being more active in your daily lifestyle, it was a pleasure to bring Shane on the podcast to dive into the science of why walking is so powerful for your mind, body, and brain. We also discuss sleep and how the combination of high step counts and quality sleep is the key if you're after high performance, creativity, and productivity. There's some fascinating research Shane discusses here, and so without further ado, let's dive in. Hi Shane, how are you? I've had a busy week. Um, I spent all of Tuesday in Amsterdam doing interviews on on the, uh, the new book, which was great. Um, it's a very weird sensation getting up in your own country, getting on a plane, spending the day working in another country and then flying back <laughs> in the evening. But uh, nonetheless, yeah, no, it's good. How about you? Yeah, it's been a brilliant week, actually. Yeah, I've been looking forward to speaking to you. I've uh, been very impressed by your work and hugely uh, appreciative of writing the book that you have written. Thank because, you. I appreciate you saying that. As we'll come on to later on the podcast, walking and more specifically to our clients who maybe listen to this, but step targets and and the the like is very much part of our core philosophy. So it's uh, it's very yeah, I'm very excited to have you on, have you on here and speak to you oh, great. and let the people know more about why I give people why we give people step targets, why we encourage them to get outside and walk and and all of that good stuff. But before we go into that, I want to I actually want to talk to you uh, about your work in experimental brain research because that's your uh, main kind of area of focus, and one area that I'm I'm always intrigued by is the topic of high performance and being a high performing, uh, not necessarily an athlete, but high performance in in productivity, in creativity, in work, uh, in building business, etc. And I know a lot of listeners are very much similar in that they they may have jobs with high stakes and they want to be at their absolute uh, best cognitively. Yeah, and it's a very broad question, but what are the key keys here for maximizing essentially brain fitness and and brain high performance? Yeah, so the the, the two things are that can be said, or maybe three things. Uh, get lots of sleep. <laughs> you need lots of rest. It's an essential part of productive living, and uh, we we see this in uh, high performance sports teams. They have sleep coaches now. Because uh, rest is an uh, absolutely core to being uh, uh, productive. I think being aerobically fit is enormously important. Um, the uh, things that are good for the heart are good for the brain. Um, and uh, then there's a kind of a suite of other things. You know, uh, to perform well, you need to know lots. Uh, so being willing to listen to others, being uh, willing to put the time in to acquire expertise. Those kinds of things, being willing to learn from your mistakes and, and being humble in the face of, of mistakes, those are the kinds of things that people need uh, to try and do. Uh, you know, when you, when you have difficult problems to solve, you won't solve them by sitting at your desk, uh, banging your head off the keyboard. Uh, you're much better off taking a break, going away, doing something else. Focus in, focus out, focus in. And, th- and that's how you will solve problems. Interesting. And, and what, exa- what can you give us an example? I mean, I have a feeling I know what you're going to say here. Uh, going out for a walk would be, would be- uh, going for a walk is a very good thing. So, you know, let's, let's, let's think about knowledge workers for, as a, a particular example of people who have to uh, use expertise. But the expertise arises in all sorts of contexts. It can be in a sporting context, it can be in a group context, it can be in lots of them. Um, and regularly, we're confronted with problems for which there are fuzzy solutions or are there, there are no solutions, particularly, or you have to choose among bad options. Um, and that, that happened. that's just unfortunately a feature of life. Um, but you can be oppressed by the things that you have to deal with, um, or you can put some distance between yourself and them. I think going for a walk is a very good one. Um, sleeping on us is by, you know, Every piece of data we've got shows that if you don't have to make the decision today and you have the time to sleep on it, having explored different solutions, come back to it tomorrow and the solution will be obvious. And that there are loads of examples of people sleeping on it um, that uh, lead them to uh, uh, solutions. But there's a kind of a 
a tricky one that's used in experimental psychology. You give people complex number problems uh, to solve and they have to figure out the rule. So, uh, and the rule is not obvious at all. But if you let half the people sleep before the attempt to problem solve, so you give them to them the night before and, and you don't let the other half sleep, the, the group that have slept will wake up and about two thirds of the time they've got the solution on waking. Oh. Um, you know, it was uh, many people refer to as kind of the committee of sleep has solved the problem for you because uh, it's taking you away from it and it gives you the chance to do abstract restructuring of memory and thought offline, which is really important for us. What happens when you're sleeping? So you mentioned a little bit there, but what ha- what is happening when you're sleeping that allows you to wake up with such sharper uh, abilities? There's, 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 there's two different things I think that are really important. One is a really recent discovery, and I think this will become a Nobel Prize, and if it hasn't, it should be. Uh, we know now that one of the absolutely key functions of sleep is to sluice out all the junk that builds up in the brain during the course of the day. Uh, you have a kind of a, a vascular system, as it's referred to, or a paravascular system. Think of it as a system of canals that opens when you sleep and it pulls all the garbage out of the brain. Um, and we know that, for example, going without a night's sleep is the equivalent to being mildly concussed. Uh, so that, by definition, is kind of cognitive impairment. Um, so doing so, on the one hand, you're cleansing the brain out. On the other hand, uh, we also know that one of the really important things that sleep does is it, it, it uh, allows you to consolidate memories and the things that have happened to you during the day. Um, if you make people deliberately, if you deliberately make people sleep deprived, uh, their memory get, becomes shot. Uh, they become very, very poor at, at recalling things that you want them to recall. So another really profound function of sleep is literally that the, the long-term storage and integration of things that you have learned during the course of the day and putting that into uh, the relevant parts of memory. And when you have all of this information in memory, problem solving is much easier. Yeah. Interesting. And what what are the what do you first classify as sleep deprivation? Oh, as as, uh, as little as, as a couple of hours sleep is, it can be sleep deprivation. Most of us, most of the time, need uh, seven to eight hours a night, uh, and we need that consistently. Um, and if we consistently re- deprive ourselves of sleep, so you say we consistently get four hours a night sleep, we're more likely to have ulcers, we're more likely to get killed by uh, a car when we're cycling to work, or we're more likely to crash. Uh, our wounds don't heal as well. And uh, in the longer term, we're predisposing ourselves to a whole range of other problems. And if you keep people up for a couple of days, they start to see things, they hallucinate, voices <laughs> start to happen, <laughs> things that aren't there, all sorts of things go wrong. Uh, sleep gives you that reset that you need every night. So people who are... Uh, people think who about kids for a moment. Uh, where does all the growth hormone that you excrete as a child when you're growing, when does that happen? When you're sleeping? When you're sleeping, exactly. Uh, all the healing that you do, that happens during sleep. Mm. So when you hear of people claim that they, oh, they, they almost boast with a badge of honor, I only slept, I can get away with five to six hours of sleep. Is that... Are yeah, they shun, them. shun them. Don't talk to them. <laughs> These people are crazy. <laughs> I will have nothing to do with them and I laugh at them whenever I can uh, because I know they're endangering their own <laughs> psychological and physical health. Yeah. I, I really do think, you know, in modern society, we, we, we have this kind of stupid macho idea that uh, we can clip an hour here and clip an hour there. You know, think about your pet dog if you have one. Um, when it's tired, what does it do? Yeah, it goes to sleep. It doesn't matter where it is. It just curls up in the corner <laughs> and yeah. goes to sleep. Whereas we think, oh, I just watch another half hour of Netflix <laughs> or, or whatever. Uh, we're the only species that does this. Um, and... Uh, we're, I think, the only species that gets Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and we know that uh, uh, sleep deprivation causes the buildup of the kind of proteins in the brain that cause Alzheimer's disease. Wow. It's a very bad idea. Mm-hmm. And for those of you, for those people who want to maximize their sleep, they do get, because there's one thing being in bed for eight hours and another thing actually getting good quality sleep. What, what are some of the best implement, uh, implement, implementable advice that you can give? 
Yeah, so that this is actually really uh, fairly straightforward. Um, and a lot of the hacks and tips are, are very straightforward. One is uh, to lower the lighting. Uh, our, our desire to sleep is triggered by the fall in light. Uh, you know, so it's paced by the day and night cycle. So in the evening, we should be exposing ourselves to lowered ambient light levels. We shouldn't have blue screens up against our faces because they're telling the, the body that it's time to wake him up, even though it's time to go to sleep. Um, the bedroom should be cool. Um, we shouldn't be getting into extremely warm beds uh, in, in a very hot room because during sleep, one of the things that, again, because you're asleep, you don't know this happens. You dump about a, a degree or perhaps two degrees C of core body temperature during sleep. It, it drops down uh, and you want to facilitate that. And often people find it difficult to get to sleep so a really good tip is to take a hot shower or a hot bath because um, that brings the blood to the surface. You dump a load of heat and then get into bed. Um, and uh, I don't have caffeine, obviously. If, if, if you're caffeine sensitive, drinking a cup of coffee at 10 o'clock and hoping to sleep at 11, it's not a good idea. Your <laughs> heart will be <laughs> jumping away. Um, those kinds of things. And have, have a, a, a good routine. Um, Go try to go to bed at the same time. Let's say not every night because that's impossible, but uh, reasonably consistently during the week and try and get up reasonably consistently. Um, and there's a, a funny thing that happens with people with sleep. Uh, most people, if, if, if uh, you put a sleep monitor on people uh, and you, you record them falling into, into sleep, uh, what you'll find is that most people are gone within five minutes or so of closing their eyes. But there's a long tail of, of people that can take up to 40 minutes uh, to, to go under. And those people find that very distressing, lying there uh, for that period of time. And this is why uh, short courses of cognitive behavior therapy are immensely successful. Uh, because what they do is teach people to relax and get comfortable with the idea that it's going to take them a little time to, to fall asleep. Uh, much, much better than drug therapy. Um, kind of almost a mindfulness thing about going asleep. This is the way my body works and I will just relax into it. So just accepting that it will take you 30 just, minutes just to sleep. Exactly, just acceptance. That's the, the key thing. This is the way you're built. Interesting. Yeah. So the, 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 there's not as much individual variability in how much sleep people need as popular belief may suggest. No, no. And in fact, uh, uh, we've got good smartphone data on this uh, and uh, we know that males... Uh, will typically sleep seven uh, to seven and a half hours and females sleep seven and a half to eight hours. Uh, we don't know why there's a sex difference, but there is. there seems to be one coming out of the smartphone data. And uh, we know, you know, look, when you get up in the middle of the night because you have to take a flight, um, you feel like hell <laughs> for hours afterwards. We, we know that you can't do this to yourself uh, consistently. Um, uh, there, there, there's a maximal... Or, sorry, there's a, an optimal relationship between your productivity and the amount of rest that you have. Um, uh, you, you can't be in top gear all the time. That will just burn your engine out. You need uh, downtime in order to be able to, to perform productively. Yeah. How do you personally get your downtime? I, I walk. <laughs> <laughs> Ironically, you know, <laughs> given the topic of this podcast. Uh, uh, anyway. <laughs> I, I read. Um, I, I, I try not to watch TV. <laughs> um, I, 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 I tend to binge watch uh, Netflix every couple of weeks. But uh, uh, walking and reading, uh, or you know, uh, going out with friends, or those kinds of things, are the kinds of things I do for, uh, for downtime. So it's the perfect segue. Very boring, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> it works for you, and uh, I think it's probably the best thing to do. I mean, you always feel better after you come back from a walk. You always feel better when you read something that's off topic and you feel better when you're with your friends. So yeah. it's the best way to recharge. Uh, and it's a perfect segue because you've written a book called In Praise of Walking. So, so tell us in one sentence, what, why is walking so, uh, why have you written a book on it and why is, should there be so much praise on it? Yeah, so uh, walking is, I, in my view, the adaptation that humans have that has made us unique. Um, you know, when you look at all the other species on the planet, uh, we make this peculiar transition at the age of uh, 12 months or so where we're, we move from crawling, which is very stable, to walking on two feet, which is very unstable. 
and we do that for the next 60, 80, 70 years, whatever it happens to be. And we're built to be able to walk 15 or 20 kilometers a day, day in, day out for the whole of our lives. Um, but we've managed to construct a society uh, where we might walk two kilometers a day, which is yeah. not very much at all. Uh, we're built for movement. Our bodies are built for uh, movement and we should be taking advantage of that and profiting from that. And unfortunately, we don't. I mean, a lot of this is due to the sedentary lifestyle we live and the the way cities are set up, the way environments are created. But what are the, the big dangers of this? Why is, you know, people only walking one to two kilometers a day such an issue that is causing so many problems in society? Yeah, the, the, there's no doubt about that. But we, we, we have... Uh, managed, you know, there, there are kind of two problems that humans have to cope with in life. One is finding enough food to live on, and uh, the other is conserving it. And evolution has solved that in a particular way for us. We, we, are, we are exceptionally good at, at extending our range. We, uh, we walk much further uh, than any other species will do. Um, on the other hand, though, when we found food, we conserve it, it conserve the energy. With, uh, so, you know, you, you have a big feast and you flop out. <laughs> that, that's the way we're built. Um, and we've solved the problem of food in modern life. You know, go into your local uh, town centre, there will be tens, if not uh, hundreds of shops and cafes and restaurants. Food is, is abundant. The calorie quality may not be what you would like. The source may not be what you like, but the, the energy is there. Um, but the problem is we've designed uh, out our range of movement. So, you know, take, take for example, the turn of the last century in the UK. We, we knew, or we know that the average workman in London walked somewhere between eight and 10 miles a day, six days a week in London, uh, around about 1900. Uh, if you walk a mile and a half today, you're doing very, very well. And there was no obesity back in those days because people walked lots. Yeah. Um, and of course, they had access to fewer calories, which is the, kind of the other side of the equation as well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's crazy how the simple act of walking can do so much. And one thing uh, a lot of our clients always surprise, get surprised at is our, our focus on giving people a step target. And, you know, whether the, 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 the number is 8,000, 10,000, 12,000, it's irrelevant. And the idea is that we focus so much on it because I mean, it'd be interesting to know the science behind it. But in my, from what I've seen, those who keep their neat higher, so their non-exercise activity thermogenesis higher, through just being more active of the day, tend to be leaner and get better results uh, in their in their body composition than those who who might just weight train but never really pay attention to their steps and their general activity. Is that, is that how it's stacked up in the science? That that's what you've said there in a is in a nutshell the absolute problem uh, that we have uh, with with uh, movement in the modern world. People mistake going to the gym for an hour in the evening after it's flopping around for 10 hours in a chair and thinking that that would be enough. And it's the energy expended over the course of the day uh, through other types of movement that you need to augment uh, and facilitate things. So just focus on the step count for a moment. I think it's really important, like you're, you're doing, uh, to have a target. Um, and we can count steps now really easily because we've all got smartphones or Bits or garments or whatever it happens to be. Uh, and we know that people don't walk much. So uh, from the smartphone data, uh, we know that the Japanese walk the most, um, about five and a half thousand steps a day. And uh, in uh, the kind of Western Europe, North America, we typically walk around about four and a half thousand steps a day. And then uh, the Saudi Arabians walk the least, presumably because of the, the uh, really very high temperatures there. And they put in about three, three and a half thousand steps a day. So uh, when I'm asked this question, I always say 5,000 more than you're currently doing. <laughs> yeah. So if you're doing four and a half thousand, that should be nine and a half thousand. If you're doing 3,000, it should be 8,000. Uh, but it needs to be day in, day out, and ideally distributed in some chunks across the course of the day, rather than just simply uh, rocking it out in one go. Why is that? Uh, because, again, the body is designed for regular bouts of movement uh, rather than one very, very severe bout of movement. Uh, yeah, ideally, if you, if, if you want to get the maximum gain, what you need to do is, is uh, uh, engage in this kind of directed movement multiple times during the course of the day. So you put the body under some strain, it recovers from it. You put it under some more strain, it recovers from it. And you do that in multiple sequences. 
this kind of dispersed activity is is mm. really what we're very good at. Yeah, interesting. And then does that does it matter uh, the speed you're walking at, the intensity, or anything like that, or, or the, even well, the location? Does do these factors play uh, play a part in in the benefits you gain from walking? So uh, again, that's a, a really great question, and th- th- there's a complicated answer. So if you if you're looking purely for for aerobic gains, uh, what you need to be doing is walking at a sufficient tempo that you're breaking a sweat, but talking to somebody else is kind of hard, and that you're a little bit flushed uh, by the time you've done it. So for the average adult, that could be five point eight six kilometers an hour, something like that, and keeping that up for forty minutes or more. And that you will get substantial aerobic gains from that. However, um, any movement is good. Uh, <laughs> engaging in any degree of activity is 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 really important. So there, we know from all the the epidemiology and other work that's been done that for every level of movement that you engage in above the most sedentary, the chances of, of death and contracting other non-communicable diseases fall. And then, of course, there's other types of walking. You know, going for a walk with a pal. Uh, to talk about a difficult problem or talk about whatever you want to talk about, how your team is playing. Um, you don't typically do that at high speed. <laughs> you do that uh, for other reasons, for so- social purposes. But you can crank out 5,000 steps um, in a in an hour like that, having had a wonderful conversation and not noticed it at all. Mm. That's really, really good for you. Um, and there's a kind of an overlooked thing about this. You know, so if you stand in one place, say at a standing desk, um, your body has a real problem, which is that blood and fluids will accumulate uh, or will tend to want to accumulate in the lower extremities, in in the calf muscles and in the feet. Uh, um, Curiously and interestingly, cardiologists will tell you that uh, they regard the calf muscles as almost like a secondary heart because when you're walking, their job is to return the blood uh, that would otherwise have accumulated in the feet right back up to the body. They can't do this when you're standing. Uh, they need muscle or they need movement in, in order for this uh, ejection of blood out of the feet to happen back up to the uh, uh, the rest of the body. That's very interesting. Is that why you feel? Is that why you get you feel so good after a walk? Is that the reason? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're getting it pumping all over, and uh, this is why standing on a on a parade ground in the sun is so bad for you, <laughs> and you will faint uh, oh, okay. from it because uh, your blood isn't circulating properly. One thing I've always noticed is, uh, and this probably kind of links to this, is that in periods of my life where I've noticed that my step count is lower than it should be, I know I know I haven't set my day up correctly, or I, I'm not being as productive as normal, or there's something that's not organized in my life. And I almost, cor- I always say this to a lot of people that correlate how good my step count is to how good everything else in my life is. I don't yeah. know if it's, if it's a placebo or if it's something literally scientifically back there. In oh, how no, you- again, you're, you're totally on the money. Um, we know that uh, people feel, underestimate how good they will feel after a walk. Uh, they overestimate uh, how bad they will feel. They won't feel bad at all. Uh, but there are people who, quote, dread walking. Um, mm. But uh, what is always the case is when you ask somebody to estimate how good they are feeling now, let's say they might tell you, ah, three out of five on a, on a five-point scale. And how good will you feel after a walk? They'll say, oh, maybe 3.2. Then take them out for 20 minutes and then ask them how they feel. They'll say four and a half. Um, so we're very bad at estimating how good a walk will make us feel. I, I actually think this is a kind of a flaw in, in our makeup. Uh, that uh, we we constantly misperceive uh, and underestimate how good a walk will make you feel, um, and we know from the, the kind of the large scale studies that have been done that people who are very active, uh, who do lots and lots of walking, are much less likely to suffer from major depressive disorder than uh, people who uh, uh, are less active. Now the problem is we don't know if walking will cure major depressive disorder. I don't think it will. But uh, it kind of acts as an inoculant against it um, for at least a fraction of the population. I think you mentioned in your book about it, uh, long, long walks help bring down, is it ILK or internet? IL6. Yeah, that's one uh, of the molecules that builds up when you're in those who are more with, uh, 
have, have depress, depressive tendencies? Is that correct? Yeah, so the, the IL-6 is a, is a molecule that is kind of pro-inflammatory. Uh, so it, it gives you a kind of a low-grade systemic inflammation or systemic inflammation. Uh, and other molecules do this as well. Uh, the, the bad cholesterol, LDL, uh, has similar kinds of effects. And uh, what you see, again, in people who walk lots is a really dramatic fall in the volume or the, the amount of these molecules circulating in the blood. Um, IL-6 typically by up to three quarters uh, and low density uh, lipoprotein uh, LDL by between a quarter and a half. Uh, it, uh, these are really big effects. They're much bigger than you get from taking a statin, for example, uh, which might clip 10 or 15% off your LDL. Uh, you know, so uh, the, the exercise or the walking prescription is a really, really important part of, of uh, generally feeling healthy. And then there's another aspect to this as well, which is not so well understood. So I, I don't go into it in great detail in my book, but I do, I do mention it, is that when you put muscle under strain, uh, especially uh, the muscles of the legs, uh, molecules are created called myokines. Uh, uh, and these molecules uh, help remodel blood vessels they, they're restorative in nature. They, they, they kind of build resilience. They do a lot of positive things for you. But the key thing is they're only produced when you're active. Um, they're not produced when you're inactive. So that feeling of sluggishness that you get is actually arising from two things. It's arising from the feelings you get from not moving, but it's also arising from the deprivation you're getting of the production of all of these other lovely things that are happening in, in your body. Well, it's fascinating. It's good to know that there's you know, hard science behind all of this. Oh, there's loads of science. <laughs> what are some of the other big benefits of walking? I, I know uh, you talk extensively about creativity, which is one I can relate to. Uh, I always I always talk about going on unplugged walks. So I, I typically write in the morning and then I go to the gym and I walk to the gym, which is about 25 minutes, but I don't listen to anything. I just walk. And I find that on the way to the gym, my brain is just on overdrive. And I get <laughs> yeah. to the gym... And I have so many ideas. I'm like, I want to be back at my desk now. Uh, what What's going on here? Why is that happening? Oh, to the phone is my advice. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great idea, actually. Yeah, oh, I, I dictated quite a bit of that book. Uh, I wrote it while walking. Oh, wow. Now, of course, what I dictated was terrible. I, I had to tidy the text up afterwards. But uh, um, you can lose those ideas. So what's going on is uh, there's an awful lot going on. So... Well, one of the first things is just compare what's happening in your brain. When we're both seated now, which we shouldn't be, um, mm -hmm. to when we're both standing. Uh, there's a lot of changes. So at the moment, uh, I'm seated, you're seated. Brain doesn't have to worry too much about balance because that's taken care of. It doesn't have to worry much about stability because that's taken care of. Uh, so those rhythms that will be there are gone, uh, or, or at least they're quiescent in the background. Um, when we're seated, we're not preparing for movement. So the kind of uh, what's called a premotor function, getting ready to actually engage in action, we, again, is quiescent. So all of these things are, are damped down when we're seated. But when you're up and around and moving, your body is preparing you for action of every type. Now, it might just be taking a step, but it might be running away from that damn yellow thing that's over there that actually might be a tiger uh, or, you know, not getting hit by the bus as you, as you run across the road or whatever. It doesn't really matter, but the, the point is that the body is ready for action. And the purpose of having a brain is movement. So, And this is the challenge that it, it, it responds to. So when you're up and about, your senses are all sharpened. You see things better. Your peripheral vision improves. Your hearing improves. Your sense of touch improves. All of these things, your smell improves. It's, it's remarkable. So uh, the activity in the brain uh, when you're up and about is greater um, but one of the things I think that happens also is um, when you're moving, um, you can get into a nice state where you're kind of zoning in and zoning out on a problem and sort of half-formed ideas that are below the level of consciousness uh, now have enough kind of, of a boost behind them uh, in terms of the, the kind of activity that's spread around the brain that they now pop into consciousness. And you can say, oh, that's a great idea, or, that's a stupid idea, or... Maybe I can work with this. So this is, a, I think, one of the things that goes on. And of course, all the, not all, but many of the great writers of the years, they love uh, to go and walk first before they write. Um, I, and in my case, I like to write and walk <laughs> at the same time. 
Brilliant. And, and you know, we, when, you, when you hear these benefits, why are, why is it so almost frowned upon to, to be walking more when you're at work? You know, I, I'm, I'm lucky enough to control my own schedule and, and, and be able to go out for walking breaks. But I know a lot of people are stuck at a chain to the desk from eight in the morning till I mean, it could be six, six seven, eight, nine yeah. at night. And they always tell me I can't get out for a walk at lunch or I can't walk much. I can't really do many steps because I have to wake up early or do it at night and then I lose sleep. Like what's the, what are some better things that they can do where they can almost integrate into their day without their boss shouting at them? <laughs> yeah. But you see their boss is wrong. You know, uh, there's a whole cultural problem here. Uh, one that's not really dealt with or understood particularly well. Bosses and many of them, not all of them obviously think you're being productive when you're seated at your desk. Uh, and actually you may have your best ideas when you're standing in the shower <laughs> when you're yeah. walking to the office, uh, from the train station or uh, whatever it happens to be uh, and they, they misperceive uh, this presenteeism for productivity and of course we should be measuring people by their output and not by the, their perceived inputs so uh, again this is a, 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 I think a real cultural problem just like the cultural problem to do with sleeping it's not macho uh, to miss out sleep, it's kind of stupid. Uh, and it's kind of stupid to think that people will become productive just because they're seated at their desk. Uh, actually, that's not how productivity works at all. And uh, there is no way, you know, when you, you look at the, take the great artists of, of, of the years, uh, great musicians or whoever, do you think you're going to get the maximum productivity out of them by chaining them to one place and uh, focusing their all their activity on a keyboard? Of course not. Uh, they feed what they... Uh, their, their, their brilliance by all of the things that they pick up when they're moving around and by the things that happen internally uh, because they're engaged in movement. So there's a cultural issue here uh, and it needs to be changed. And what do you suggest for these people? Um, what's the changes? What can they do? You know, that's within well, their- you know I, I think that there's going to be a competition, isn't there, uh, between uh, places that recognize the correct way to uh, treat people where productive work is concerned and places that don't. And there will be a flight from uh, places that aren't like that. But, you know, uh, there's kind of a larger kind of social issue, isn't there? Uh, which is that uh, mandatory rest breaks were hard won. Uh, they were only brought in, in uh, uh, during the First World War because people who weren't resting tended to blow up their munitions factories because they were making mistakes. Um, and uh, people who were working in mines who didn't rest tended to get killed. Uh, you know, so there's a kind of an occupational liability history behind the need for rest breaks. And we've kind of changed the, the type of work that we're doing now. So lots of us are doing kind of knowledge-oriented work. Um, and when and again, you look at the great workers, uh, the, sorry, the, the great artists of the, of, the, of the years, novelists, if they produce... 250 words in a day they're really happy with themselves they do that in the morning and they go off and do something else for the afternoon and they produce a Nobel Prize winning uh, book at the end of the year it's the outputs that matter <laughs> not the inputs but uh, getting a manager to see that uh, who chooses to remain ignorant of it is, is, a, is a big problem so leadership matters and, and rules matter as someone who works in an office what do you do to, uh, to combat that? Um, well, I'm in the, the lucky position as an academic, but I don't have anybody staring over my shoulder. Okay. Uh, I, I, I have to account for myself in terms of my outputs, but uh, I don't have to account my, myself in terms of being chained to the desk or to the lecture hall. Uh, so I have to turn up and do my lectures. But for example, last night I, I, I was able to prepare my lecture on Alzheimer's disease that I'm going to give at three o'clock today at home um, after everybody had gone to bed because it was a much better time uh, to tweak that lecture than doing it during the day. So, uh, you know, there, I think uh, uh, I, I'm in a happy position where I, I've got a lot of control over my own time and I have to account for myself by my outputs. Um, do I do good lectures? Do I publish uh, appropriate papers? Do I bring in grant money? Do I do the all that kind of thing? That, that, those are the metrics rather than have I got a a jacket on the back of my chair that somebody can check to see whether yeah. I'm present. Or... I mean, you're just uh, inspersing breaks in your day with where you go for Oh, yeah. Yeah, all of that kind of thing as well. I, I set my laptop so that it gives me a ring every 25 minutes and I get up and I go for a 10-minute walk. 
Okay, so that's pretty frequent then. I mean, you, do you find that you lose your flow state or do you, are you able to... Um, oh, compete? no, that resets it. Uh, <laughs> I think you can work intensely for 10 or 15 minutes or 20 minutes and then uh, you, you really need uh, time away from it. And I think it actually is really good for uh, resetting it. I, I think it's a really, really good way of, of maintaining, especially, you know, if you manage uh, to block off three hours to really focus on on something. Um, and I would do that where writing books are concerned. I need lots of blocks of three hours to, to get things written um, and to get things done. Uh, resetting yourself by getting up and moving uh, is actually the best way uh, of all to do it. Interesting. I've always gone for like 90 to 120 minutes before a break, but I might have to try bringing it down a bit more. Yeah, no, you see what works for you. You know, there will be some individual variation. And, and of course, there are times when you're really stuck in the middle of something and it's going really well. So just yeah. keep going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but then when you run out, get up, go for a walk and come back. You'll, you'll find that the tank is, is recharged. One question that has been playing on my mind for a couple of minutes now is when you mentioned about um, the best ideas come in the shower. What's the, yeah. what's the brain research behind that? Why is, why is that? Or, or when you're even going for a walk or whenever you're completely not thinking about it, why does the brain suddenly pop up with the best ideas? Yeah, so the, we actually at last can answer this question in a semi-sensible way. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it is one of these things that people had the observation that you could do it, but we now have a, a kind of a good idea of what's going on in the brain. So um, if, if, if uh, you put somebody in a brain scanner and uh, you ask them to do nothing, literally nothing, just lie there, uh, rather than, you know, maybe trying to find all the X's in a... In a a, a field of letters that are, are scattered where they have to focus their attention on something very particular. What happens is people engage in what's now called the default mode uh, of activity. And this is something we do for lots and lots of time every day. About 30, 40 percent of our time is kind of zoned out from the, the immediate tasks we're engaged in. And we're thinking about the big picture in our lives, um, who we have conversations with, what I said to somebody about something, what I'm intending to do tomorrow, all of those kinds of things. So this is, we spend a huge amount of our mental life doing this. And we spend a lot of our mental life focused on little problems. And when you image people uh, who are doing creative problem solving, what you find is remarkably, they're able to have the network that's involved in big picture stuff active at the same time as the network that's involved in the detail. Uh, so the metaphor I use is that they're able to see the forest and the trees mm. at the same time. Uh, and that's what's going on when you're getting people or when people are doing kind of creative problem solving. They're zoning in, they're zoning out, they're focusing on the issue and they're focusing away and they're keeping the issue in mind at the same time as drifting a little bit away from it. And this allows other associations to crowd in uh, that can point you to a problem that you wouldn't otherwise necessarily be able to do. I feel like you're coming into full circle with a lot of things here where it's sleep, it's walking, it's taking time away and it's, it's recharging that is so crucial to be able to be a high performer. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and this is true of every aspect of our lives. You know, if you didn't recharge yourself with food every day, uh, you'd find your performance <laughs> drift away. And, you know, there, there are other aspects to our being that we really need uh, to worry about sleep, as I've said, and uh, aerobic exercise. And obviously strength training is, is vitally important for uh, other aspects of our, of our society as well. But yeah, these are, you know, and, I, and when you say them out loud, it's kind of obvious. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but not until you say it out loud. <laughs> but it's also convincing people that it, it's, is 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 one thing hearing it from like for myself, and then another thing hearing from a professor like you who who's seen all the the research and the 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 problems that will come with not listening to you, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but again, you know, we 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 live in a world where people believe often what they want to believe, and they, they sometimes believe very silly things. And uh, you know, it's it's often consequence free. You can you can float by without. Uh, <laughs> It's having too much of a great consequence for you, but uh, you know it can go terribly wrong. You know, they, like the data on sleep, for example, are really clear. Uh, if uh, you top and tail your sleep, you're more likely to die uh, because of accidents. You're more likely to die because of cancer. You're more likely to die from infectious diseases. You're more likely to be ill. You're more likely to hallucinate. Uh, all of those things, and the same is true of aerobic exercise. 
we know with certainty that if you spend a lot of time sitting around, your blood vessels are going to sludge up, uh, your heart is eventually going to stop working particularly well. There will be all those kind of uh, malign changes in the periphery. And the same is true in the brain. The brain is built for movement. Uh, if you don't exercise it, you don't use it, you're going to lose it. You need to you need to get it out there and get it moving. By aerobic exercise, do you mean uh, running or do you mean literally fast-paced walking is, is good enough? Uh, in, well, in my case, I'm prejudiced towards walking, so I'm yeah. going to say <laughs> fast-paced walking. I don't want to come down on runners um, or uh, you know swimmers or cyclists or anything else. Uh, I think all of these things are, are very important. But for most people, for most of the day, uh, being able to go and take a quick walk even for 10 minutes is easy because you don't need to put on special shoes. You don't need to have a, uh, a shower afterwards. You don't need to get wet and have to dry yourself off because you've been in the swimming pool or whatever it happens to be. Um, so walking is the thing that we need to engineer lots of into our the course of our day. And then we can do other things as well. There's nothing stopping us doing that. So Shane, I have to ask, what is your average step count? Uh, so on Tuesday, I was really happy with myself. I did 21,000 steps. Um, which was great. Yesterday, I think it was, I'll just check, it was about 11,000, uh, which isn't great. And today, so far, it's just shy of 4,000. Um, and I'll probably add about another six or 7,000 this evening to it. Nice. So, you, you tend to average around that 10 to 12 mark then? But it, yeah, but I, what I really want to do is is around the 14 to 16. Um, and I find that easier to hit at the weekends usually than uh, uh, during the week. Uh, yeah. But what I, what I hope to get is a walking desk for my office. And uh, you, a, a friend of mine who has one does 22, 25,000 steps a day, every day without noticing. Um and uh, because he's got a lovely walking desk. So I, I think if I could make one physical change to my environment, uh, that would be it. I do have a standing desk, uh, but uh, I, I, I would prefer to have a, a self-paced uh, walking desk. Is there an upper limit to steps that you should go? You should watch out for? Or can people just keep going up and up? Oh, so that's a, that's a really good question. Uh, and I don't know that we've got a good answer to it, is the honest truth. So... You know, um, soldiers who do lots of force marching, uh, if they're doing it on the flat, can get into a rhythm where they can cover 30 kilometers a day without too much trouble, uh, so long as they get a, a good period of rest. Um, but I think, you know, for the average person, if uh, you can do, as I said, 5,000 more than you're doing, uh, whatever that happens to be, that will be... Uh, a really, really good uh, rule of thumb. Um, and I think, we, you know, it's important to, to know what kind of the reference ranges are. So average person in, in uh, Western Europe and North America is doing about four and a half thousand steps a day. We know that's not enough. So 5,000 more than that uh, will have you up at a, at a close to the 10,000 per day, which is made up, but it's actually quite good. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Um, on that note, uh, Shane, where can people find out more about you and some of the brilliant work that you've done on walking and brain health? Uh, they can go to my website, which is uh, shaneomara.com, uh, or just do a search for my name and they, they can find my amazing and wonderful book. And buy one for your friends and family and everybody else. <laughs> brilliant. So Shane's holding it up. But for those listening, it's called In Praise of Walking. Highly recommend it. We'll put it in the show notes. Uh, and it's one for definite, um, should definitely be on your reading list for 2020 and take, take note, take note of everything Shane's giving, Shane's advising here because, uh, the man knows his stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much for coming on Shane. Thanks, Ek. Gosh, that was great. I really enjoyed that. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here today on this episode of RNT Fitness Radio. I'd love for you to do a quick little favor for us. Please head over to iTunes and give us a five-star rating, leave a comment, and share it with your family and friends. If you're interested in learning more about how to transform your body and positively change your life, go to www.rntfitness.com and explore all our free content on offer. Thank you. <laughs>